filled her through this land of ours and filled a sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello, sportsman. Hey, look at the wintertime. Look at all the local lakes that a lot of people have right around them. There's people ice fishing. Ice fishing can be a lot of fun. I'll tell you what, we're going to go ice fishing. We're going to catch some bluegill. We're going to show you some techniques, how to build an ice sled. we got a lot of things to do. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Well, right out between us and that shanty, there's, there's some 40-foot water. Then it bumps up on a two-foot ledge, runs for about 25 yards, and then drops down to a 12-foot mud flat. And that's where we're hitting them. Ooh, big ones. Hit them on the mud flat? Yeah, right over the mud flat. I think they feed on wigglers and marvy and everything else. Hmm. All winter. And this is bluegill? Yes. Big bluegill. Big bluegill. A guy. Oh heck. I'm gonna jinx myself. <laughs> I know it. But a guy brought a four-inch auger last week out here and some of the gills were getting stuck in his hole coming up. Truly. Seriously. Sorry. <laughs> Lee Thomas is our guide. He's the gunsmith at Mill Creek Sports and Dexter. But he didn't say this would be as easy as shooting fish in a barrel. He just said the fishing would be very good. Well, our fishing party was a virtual parade of ice fishing sleds. The one I was using was a store-bought sled. Window up front for light from a lantern, well designed for pan fishing. But behind me was Carlos Federoff, a well-known name in the world of Michigan fishing. Carlos was pulling a homemade sled, one made from scrap lumber. It didn't have any fancy attachments, but this sled had special meaning for Carlos because his son made it for him. Behind Carlos was Charlie Keenan, pulling a sled that his father made when Charlie was 17 years old. For a 30-year-old sled, it's held up very well, and Charlie really enjoys using it because it, too, has special meaning. And behind Charlie was Matt Radzilowski pulling a deluxe homemade sled. Gary Botek from Charlotte designed and built this one. Excellent craftsmanship, and it has many features that make it extremely practical for an ice fisherman. Now, Lee Thomas brought the bait buckets on top of a portable shanty that he'd put up if it got windy. These are my last... There should be four in a row here. Oh, for your shanty. Yeah, this is this is where I've the last two times I've come. I got 31 the first time with another friend of mine. 31 what? Big gills. What's big? Mm, eight and a half. The smallest one we caught and the biggest was 10 inches. 10 inches. 10 inches. Most of them were about nine, nine and a half. And uh, these are the holes. Yep, these are the holes. And then I came three nights ago and by myself I got 18 in an hour. Whoa. And it's right at dark? Yeah, usually about an hour before dark. Great. Great. Where, where, where can I spud my hole? Well, anywhere within about a 30 foot radius. 30 foot? Okay. Anywhere in here. Right here. Well, I got started using the old time spud, which I found is kind of fun when the ice isn't too thick. The hand-me-down Swedish ice auger that's gone with Charlie Keenan's ice sled had lost its edge. So he borrowed Matt's hand-powered ice drill with a sharp blade. And these hand augers work pretty well until the end of the season. And that's when the ice gets two feet thick. Then the power auger is the practical tool for the job. But there's a fringe benefit to the hand auger or a spud. It's good exercise for the upper body. Drill? Yeah. I call this, you know, if we're doing an infomercial, this would be the Spud Glide. Send in for the Spud Glide. Seven easy payments of $49.95. Oh, 
Order your Spud Glide today. Lose weight, feel fit. If you act now, we'll include at no extra charge the skimmer trimmer to exercise your wrists. Okay, I'm threading, threading this four pound test onto this rod. Now this fishing rod, if you can take a look at these guides here, uh, this is a homemade fishing rod. This is one that a guy named Al Chase, well Al Chase was on the show with Kerry. They had a couple of recipes a few years ago and Al knew that I was an ice fisherman and he saw some of the equipment that I used that he thought was a little tacky. And he says, you need this homemade rod uh, to use for bluegill. So he gave it to me. Well, the handle and the, po and, the, and the blank was separate. Huh. And I had to put the cork on and draw it and put the rod in. Well, the cork just to make it a little bit longer. Yep, and, it, and the cork could keep your hands warm, I think. Uh, but this, is a, this is a long and limber, limber yep. ice fishing rod. That's yeah. how you like it? I like them, uh, the long rods for deep water because the farther I hold it over the head, my head, mm -hmm. I have the angle of my line coming out of the hole upwards instead of trying to pull them up the ridge of the ice. Yeah, this is a great rod with a cork handle here. Nice and warm when you have your, your gloves off. And now I gotta rig this baby up. So what I'm gonna put on here is a little teardrop. Ice fishing gear is quite small. You can see the size of this teardrop. I mean, that's a, a teeny little teardrop and I'll put a wax worm on there. This is the bobber I'm gonna use. It's a fill float and tie it in with this line. This is probably about four pound test line. But this bobber, if you don't know how they work, they work a little differently from other bobbers. These are rubber little rubber round ends that go around the end of the bobber. And what you have to do is thread the line through there to get these babies on your line. And then you tie the bobber into it wherever you want. I'll show you how that works in a minute. Next thing I do is I tie the, there we go. Well, you can't do very fancy knots with these small ones, but just tie a clinch knot. And there's the teardrop with the two little rubber tubes threaded through the line. And what I'm going to do, show you, this is how you set it up. You put the, you want the bright end of the bobber on the top. So I'll just put it right through there. And the other end of the bobber. Put like yay. And pull that tight. And this way you can move the line, pull it like that. I'm actually pulling the line through there and setting the bobber where I want it. But that'll make a nice little little float for bluegill. Okay, I got my, my wax worm on the teardrop, skimming off the remainder of the ice on the hole because I'm going to feed this down through. Now, remember, I have this bobber on the line, and initially it's a short distance from the teardrop, but I take it and I just feed it through my fingers as it slides through those little rubber tubes. It's kind of a slick idea. Now I have the line preset because I checked the depth and I let out enough line to just reach the bottom. So what I'm gonna do when I first start here is let the teardrop down almost to the bottom. Now this here should be at the bottom, but I'm about maybe eight or 10 inches above the bottom. A little ice on the top there. But look how this float floats. See it, it's mostly underwater. See that? Only the very tip is out of the water. That means it's gonna be very sensitive to any motions. I mean, if I just touch the line like that, just touch it very lightly, look at that thing wiggle. That means if a bluegill sucks it in, moves it, touches it down there, I'm gonna see it. Here we Crank go. Up, gentlemen. There, see it? There we see, go. see that, see it moving, John? What? See that, Barbara, though? I will be vindicated. That was a big one. It's still here. I've got it on. All right. Oh! How about that? Not How about that? How about that? What do you mean not giant? I, I, well, I had just, to hook it for just you. Just cut out this non-giant stuff. <laughs> this, this will set the standard for giant until we catch something bigger. <laughs> oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. You got a nice one? Oh, don't you love that? <laughs> the rod tip bouncing. Now this was right near the bottom. I set this down a little deeper. Oh, yes. Look, that's bigger. Line just broke. My line just broke, Lee. Uh -huh. That's how big it was. Oh, that's a dandy. 
Yeah, because it was a sunshiny afternoon, the bluegills didn't hit until just before dark. Well, we picked up enough for several good meals. We didn't get any of the huge bluegills, but hey, we had to save something for next week. That is a dandy gill. Agreed? This is a pretty neat deal, Carlos. You built this? Yeah. No, I didn't, actually. <laughs> My youngest son built it. And uh, he didn't like it particularly, so he gave it to me. It's just made out of scrap lumber. Scrap lumber. A little hinge there to help you get in some of your supplies. And... Yeah, it will hold, hold a bait, bait can in there and holds the rod in back. Put a longer object in, stick on yeah. here. And it's good for sitting on. And in the front there, we got a lantern, see? And you can sit on here and hold your hands over the lantern and uh, really, really keeps you very, very nice and warm. Plenty of light in the front of the hole, and that's yeah. just held on by a little hose clamp. Yeah, put a hose clamp on there. And now, one of the things they didn't like were the runners. You see, he, uh, he made a separate piece of wood here for the runners, which is okay. But what he preferred to do would be to have the whole side come down and form the one rudder. One solid the piece. Bottom. So it's one solid piece. Okay, so you're having some problems with the, the rudder kind of loosening up. It's then. loose, that's okay. right. I tried to brace it. But as little ice fishing as I do, why, uh, <laughs> it's been real good. <laughs> and you fill it up with fish from the front. That, that's a nice idea. And that's a, just a, a single hinge then? Yeah. If the he front did it there, again, so. he'd put two on. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a little bit more sturdy. That's right. But the, the, the best part of it was, it didn't cost a thing to build. <laughs> and it's awful nice to get it for a gift. Well, we took a look at Carlos's sled. His was made out of just one by six inch boards, planks, na nailed together to form a box. We're going to be doing something a little different, be recycling some of our lumber here. We have some old painted up three quarter inch plywood, roughly two and a half by three foot is what we're going to use to make our sled, as well as using a couple of half inch pieces of plywood as well. We'll be using a couple two by fours to form our rudders or skis to help pull the sled across the ice, as well as some three inch and inch and a quarter wood screws. And we, you could use a circular saw to cut the wood out. We're going to be using a table saw. Now if you have a two and a half by three foot piece of plywood, all you have to do is make two simple cuts and you're already framing up the front and sides of your ice fishing sled. That's going to look like here. You got your back here and the front up here. Then what we're going to do is take our two by fours to make our skis and just put a diagonal cut there and that's going to help it scoot across the ice a little easier. Just in case we may want to remodel our ice fishing sled in the future, we're going to be using some wood screws to hold it together. Nails just make it a little too hard if you want to take it apart. But let me give you a quick tip. If you're going to use a screw, you're going to want to pre-drill your holes first, because let me show you what happens if you don't. Well, that split that pretty good. One way to prevent that is if you take your drill and drill a pilot hole, Make sure you go all the way through and the drill bit should be a little smaller than the screw itself. That's going to prevent it from splitting out on you. I'm going to drill the pilot holes to help tie the sides together. Now what we're using is a, a drill that's the same size as a screw. And then we're going to clamp it all together and finish drilling the pilot holes into the board once it's all clamped together. Now that we tied the box together we're using the screws, it's going to give us a nice sturdy box. Now I've gone ahead already and attached the skis to the, what's going to be the bottom of our ice fishing sled using four screws on each hole and that's going to give us a nice sturdy, sturdy ski. And the reason we recessed that in is so we're able to attach the bottom to the sides of the box and we're going to go ahead and screw that together.
Well, we have the bottom and the skis already firmly attached to the bottom of the sled. It's going to work out pretty good. Now for the seat or the top, instead of using hinges, we just mounted a couple scrap pieces of wood onto the bottom, which fits nicely into the box, and that's going to prevent it from sliding off. And that also gives you some nice room to have your rods and some of the other fishing gear hang out the back. In our last step, we're just going to install a couple eye bolts to the top of each ski so we can attach our rope and haul the sled out onto the ice. Got a letter from an angler who asks, he says, I am a Michigan resident and I have an Ontario non-resident license. I launch my boat in Michigan, go across Lake St. Clair to Canada, which is 10 minutes away, and fish for perch. Now, as far as Ontario regulations, there is no limit on perch in Ontario. My question is, can I come back to the launch site in Michigan with more than 50 perch? Now, Bill Kaufman from St. Clair Shores has an excellent question of law here, Charlie. It is a good question. And most people go to the Michigan Fishing Guide which they believe is a condensation of the regulations and the statutes. We don't have the compiled law, so this is the best thing we have. This is the best thing a sportsman has. And, and this, I think, is just terribly confusing because it says here under possession limit, for his situation, it says a person fishing waters bordered by other states or provinces, and that would be Lake St. Clair, and possessing multiple fishing licenses, okay, he has licenses for both areas, may possess the limit allowed for only one license, while in transit, while in transit. But it doesn't say here, you gotta be in a vehicle or a car. Right. And he wonders, can he bring him across, back across in his boat? Yeah, in transit is in transit. I, he could be swimming with those. Yeah, but look, it says, if you go on, it says, but while fishing in Michigan waters, must comply with Michigan ah. possession limits. That, see, there's the thing. If he's coming from Canada and hasn't broken any laws in Canada, comes back across, he's fine. But oh, he can't he can stop. can transport him in his boat? Yeah. It doesn't make any difference how many oh, fish he has. This. What, what's the limit in Canada? There's no limit okay. on, on yellow perch. Okay, here he is. He's coming across in his boat. Picture this. He's caught as many perch as he can get with that license, and he's got him heaped up, and perch are falling off into the water. And he drives up to the launch site with his Ontario license, and the officer says, you have over your limit in Michigan. Well, like, no kidding. He's, but here's my he's license. He's taken too many fish, but he hasn't broken any regulations, according to the guy. Uh, and this guide is contradictory. I say if he has th that many perch in Michigan waters, it's more than 50. Yeah, we're going to have to go to our practical attorney, Sal Ghani, and I want to pose the question to him. Is a possession limit an absolute possession limit? I mean, is, is he going to get a, could he get a ticket according to the statute? Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah but you got a Canadian license. But it was legal you're, but there. You're, it was legal in Canada, but it's not legal in Michigan. And you, once, you trans, once you go over the border, you're bound by Michigan law. You can't say Canada, Canada's law is like that, so I want to apply that law. You apply the law of the jurisdiction where you are. So what about if you're fishing in Ohio waters where they allow, say, six walleye or, or whatever it is, and you come back to Michigan waters where it allows less, or, or the size limits are different? You better eat them there or leave them there. There's no way to get fish from another jurisdiction, from Ohio waters or, or Canadian waters, into Michigan legally? Legally, if you do it in a single day in an amount in excess of legal limits, it's a violation of law. The policy of the DNR is probably not to write a ticket if you're just transporting the fish from one jurisdiction to this jurisdiction. But if they in any way feel that you're fishing, um, they're going to issue a citation. There you go, Charlie. Here's another example where the statute is very specific and says possession is possession. And the DNR is a little more liberal here that says there's a little leeway. Well, we hope it. the conservation officer is reading this book. Yeah, but the key word is hope. So in answer to Bill Kaufman's question, can he come back to the launch site with more than 50 perch if he calls the officer sir and he doesn't overdo it? <laughs> because technically, he could get a ticket no matter what this book says, That's right. according to the law. Well, I tell you, there's lots of questions that this law brings up in this guidebook. If you have a question of law, you can call Sal. Look at this. This is a 26-inch spread on a 12-point has a tine that's almost a foot long, a half inch short. This was taken down in Livingston County by Chris Ash from Holly. This must have made your knees rattle. 
sure did. Made my boss's knees rattle too. Your boss's? Yeah, I How's work that? at a tree farm, and uh, we were getting ready to get done with work, and he says, "Well, let's go down and get that big buck." So I was like, yeah, sure, right. So we jumped in his van, we drove down, we got 175 acres, so we were just driving, just looking around. And we didn't have the guns or nothing. And uh, here he was, popped out. So we went back up and he got his gun, went back down, he shot at it three or four different times and missed it. So I got my gun and walked over and it was standing there about 80 yards away, and shot it and dropped, hmm. just like that. <laughs> but your boss had first chance. He had first chance and he blew it. No, blew it. How many times did he blow it? Yeah, three or four. Three or four times, and that's that's amazing. Well, why did this deer stay around? Why did you get a shot at? I don't know. I just I didn't expect to see it. I was just you know walking, and there it was, just looking at me. It didn't go far from where he shot it. Fifty yards. That was it. Hmm. Yeah. Do you still work there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this does this hang on the hang on the wall at work? It will now. It will. Okay. Well, good. Well, that's a, a 12 point with a 26 inch spread. You don't see them much wider than that. Came from Livingston County. Look at those, look at those brow tines coming out of there. Those are incredible. Well, congratulations, Chris. Thanks. Chris Ash from Holly. The trophy interviews we show on the Practical Sportsman are all videotaped at our annual Fishing and Hunting Awards banquets. And this year's banquets are coming up real soon. Nobody goes away hungry. The award winners receive their awards on stage where they're interviewed for the trophy book. The best stories appear on the Practical Sportsman. So, so your buddy snores loud, huh? Oh, you... uh, I, I was laughing at that because John has had similar complaints about me, and he wears earplugs when we go. This was unbelievable. All you women out there, I sympathize with you guys. You got guys out there that keep you up at night. I, I couldn't believe them. I, I tell you, I thought, I thought he died a couple times. <laughs> So the idea is, it's a good time to ice fish, get your warm clothes on, get outdoors, it's a great place to be, and make sure whatever you do, have fun. That's what it's all about. See you next week. Oh! How about that? Not bad. Not How giant. about that? What do you mean, not giant? I, I, well, I had just, to hook it for just you. Just cut out this non-giant stuff. <laughs> this, this will set the standard for giant until we catch something bigger. <laughs> oh, ooh, ooh. Oh! Nice oh, don't you love that? <laughs> the rod tip bouncing. Now this was right near the bottom. I set this down a little deeper. Oh! Yes. Look, that's bigger. Line just broke. My line just broke, Lee. Uh -huh. That's how big it was. Oh, that's a dandy. Yeah, because it was a sunshiny afternoon, the bluegills didn't hit until just before dark. Well, we picked up enough for several good meals. We didn't get any of the huge bluegills, but hey, we had to save something for next week. That is a dandy gill. Agreed? <laughs>